Welcome, everybody. I'm Kyle Hine, and I'll be hosting the Players Podcast, a GTM family production in partnership with the EuroLeague Players Association. I will be having in-depth conversations with current and former EuroLeague players about important topics that many athletes face on and off the basketball court. Stay tuned for more episodes. What up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Players Podcast presented to you by the EuroLeague Players Association. Today, we have a very special guest. He's an ACB champion. He's an NBA draft pick, a former EuroLeague Rising Star winner, Olympic medalist, um, you know, one of the, the best players of his generation. Um, my guy, Alec, Alex Sabrinas. Alex, how's everything, man? This is good. Thanks for the intro. <laughs> oh man, it's hey man, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <man. laughs> Thanks. Those are all things that you did. <laughs> I know, I know. It looked better when you said it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> oh man, I appreciate you uh, you know, taking the time, um, you know, getting on. Um, you know, obviously I know we both had busy schedules, man, but uh thank you for uh, for joining the podcast and um talking about some important topics today. Uh, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Now, my, my first question is, um, game five, the, the final buzzer finally goes off. Um, what are the first emotions that go through your head, um, you know, of this recent series that you that you guys had with Zanit? Uh, hard to tell. Uh, I think uh, we felt a lot of pressure during the series. And I mean, obviously, I mean, we won easy the, the last game, but still, like when we heard the, the buzzer beat and we knew we were back in the final four after seven years uh, as a FC Barcelona, uh, everybody felt great. Like you could see the faces uh, after a couple of weeks uh, that we've been struggling, trying to beat uh, a great team like uh, Zenit. Uh, I mean, it was all about happiness. Uh, you could see the faces, the coaches also like throwing water to start us after the yeah, game. I seen that. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it was really nice, especially for the guys, I mean, like me, uh, that I was here in Barcelona playing before I went to the NBA. And we played 2014, I guess, the, the last Final Four in, in Milan. Mm -hmm. And since then, like, uh, they've never been there. So, you know, it's a big step for the club. And it, from a way that I see it, it's uh, putting Barca again on the... On the highest level in, in Europe, so yeah, that's, so that's what I was going to ask. What what does it mean to Barca and to the fans and and, and to the club, um, you know, to be back on the final four? You know, mm -hmm. especially after last year. You know, you, we had the season stopped unfortunately because of COVID, yeah. but um, you know, you guys pretty much led the table throughout the whole entire season. So, what does it mean to you know to the guys in the locker room, but also to the fans of Barcelona? Yeah, for Barcelona, it means a lot, especially because all those years that we. Uh, we were out of the final four. Uh, Madrid was winning, so yeah. especially for the fans, that's that's yeah. a problem <laughs> because you could see the, the opening, uh, getting trophies in Spanish league and Euro league, and, and you're not getting anything. So now that we're back, and well, Madrid is not there, <laughs> uh, I guess for them, it's, it's just like a big pleasure, and, and I think they're gonna try to enjoy from, from their houses because uh, it's without the fans. But but still, I think they're gonna support us and, and be with us because it's a big time now. The so the opportunity to win your first Euro League title, um, you know, what would that mean to you to to be able to you know win the championship? Like I said, I mean, you've accomplished a lot so far in your career, but mm -hmm. what would a Euro League final four mean to you? Well, as you said before, like that's the only thing <laughs> I got left to win, so <laughs> it means a lot. <laughs> I got I mean, Olympic medals, the Spanish League, Kings Cup, whatever, but I still don't have uh, the Euroleague trophy, so I'm going for it. I'm sorry because <laughs> nah, I know, <laughs> I know, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really excited. <laughs> I got I got my journalist hat on today, so I'm I'm about, I'm, about, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the the matchup. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, this is. I think. I mean, it's, obviously, it's going to be a fun matchup. I mean, it's going to be a fun matchup, yeah. you know, between us and mm -hmm. it's the final four. So the best teams, the best four teams, got to play yeah, each other. Obviously. So it is. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Now you alluded to it a little bit about Madrid, but um, mm -hmm. for the fans and for people that don't know and don't understand, describe what El Clasico, um, the atmosphere, and what is it? You know, what does it mean to the to the people of Spain and to the people of Barcelona and also to the to the people of Madrid as well. 
I mean, I think it, it comes a lot from from the soccer. Obviously, here in Spain, soccer is the big time, uh, more than basketball. Uh, and it's uh, like a big rivalry. Like, uh, sometimes it gets really mad, yeah. <laughs> per se, because <laughs> me as a player, I don't want to see that between yeah. fans. Uh, but but still, like, uh, when we go to Madrid and play their Classico, the, the fans from there get crazy. And then we, when they come here, it's it's about the same. And And I think it's... There's this uh, hate relationship between the fans, mm-hmm. as I said, not the players, because I'm, I don't have any yeah. problem with the players. Um, but I think also the politics uh, kind of get into it. Uh, you know, the situation here in, in Catalonia for the mm-hmm. last years, they won the independence and then and, and the Spanish government sent the police a couple of years ago when we tried to vote for, for that. So I think it's all messed up. Uh, yeah. They re- they're related like the Spain government with Madrid and then Barcelona, it's the Catalonia. So that didn't help uh, through the last years. And, and I think these hate relations, it was getting bad. Now, after a year with our fans, maybe it got better, <laughs> but <laughs> you never know. <laughs> that, that's what I try to explain to people too, um, you know, about the rivalries like Olympiacos, Panathinaikos, and, you know, uh, like you said, El Clasico and even like Partizan and Red Star. Like it's, it's more than just a sport sometimes. Um, like it's, it's a lot more. Do you, when you were in the States um, and, you know, did your teammates ever ask you or ask you any questions about it? Or how would you describe it to them? Yeah, a little bit, because I remember the first year that uh, we actually came here to play Madrid and, and Barcelona. Mm-hmm. And they were asking me like, how were the fans and stuff? And I always show them videos from obviously from Greece or yeah. <laughs> or Serbia or some of these uh, crazy countries and, and they were just freaking out with the fans uh, with all the smoke uh, like throwing stuff coins mm-hmm. whatever and and they were getting like crazy because they never saw that before and they used to like a different kind of fans uh, in the states and I mean, they were saying like, I don't know how you guys can play like this. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's so much pressure, so much things going on. <laughs> oh yeah. So sometimes I don't even know how we how we yeah. how we do it. I guess it's, it's almost just like like natural to us now. I guess you could say. Yeah. Now Saris has um, you know in a short time become one of the most respected coaches in your league. Um, you know, after work with him, you know, this season. Um, you know, what have you kind of learned from him? I learned a lot. I mean. He yells like crazy. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you win, you lose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you always find tense. something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but even like he's been coached for what, like four or five years, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's great. I mean, the one of the things he has is like he knows when to uh, push and, and make you like practice like crazy or on the games, especially on the games, he gets mm-hmm. a little bit <laughs> crazy. But he also knows, uh, like he's been a player, so he also knows when to give like days off or when to slow down a little bit on the practices because he knows like the important day is the, the game day. So that's the thing that I've seen that we didn't have before mm-hmm. uh, in well, last year or, or before I went to the NBA. And I mean, it's great. And, and the thing he knows also, uh, it's in the games, he has the ability to, to change things, you know, change yeah. some defense when something is not going right or put some offenses after the timeouts to get like an easy shot or easy bucket and i mean he's really good obviously like he has help but yeah but he's the main coach so he's really smart in these situations yeah i agree i definitely agree now um you know what what was your first reaction when you heard that pal was coming back to barca (laughs) Um, <laughs> did you believe it? Because <laughs> like that, like that week was crazy. He the first they said he signed, and he yeah. out the video he did sign, and then he he did, then he, yeah. did yeah. Then all of a sudden he signed. So what was the reaction to you guys like in the locker room, like you know, kind of going through this? My first reaction was like, how, how much money does Barca have to pay? This guy? <laughs> <laughs> like the Brooklyn, like the, the Brooklyn Nets, man. Going on and yeah. Now yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, we were so happy when. When we realized he was coming, like obviously, uh, he, he was injured for like two years almost. Mm-hmm. So we were kind of like, let's see how he comes, uh, physically, special. But like, as a player, like he's he was gonna help us a lot. Like he's won everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's been in the uh, NBA for 
almost 20 years and he has a lot of experience and, and he's showing to us like he's trying to teach us things that we don't see uh, special mm -hmm. situations and offense and defense that might help us and he's did, doing a, a really good job as a as a leader that's good, that's so, good man. he's getting better every day so yeah so i'm so he's he's had a uh i guess you could say an early impact and an early influence on the team mm -hmm. already he would say I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's power, like what you can expect. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's probably the best, best Spanish player of all time. Like, it doesn't matter. He's 40. Like, he still gets 20 points. And the yeah. other day against Zenith, he, he got four blocks and he played amazing. So uh, I hope he can help us a lot in, in this uh, uh, final part of the season. I want to ask about um, the 2016 um, Olympics. Um, you know, what was the feeling, you know, for you to, you know, represent your country on such a, a big stage um, and, you know, something that not many people get an opportunity to to feel, you know, to win a medal, to to, you know, drape your country's flag or hear your country's national anthem being played um, as you're being awarded a menu. So what was that? What was that feeling like for you? I mean, I'm going to explain something about the summer because yeah. uh, while we were practicing, uh, it was a, a tough summer because, First, I said no to the NBA, and then after KD left, they came back with another offer, and, and I finally said yes. So I had to leave for almost a week to mm -hmm. sign the contract and, and pass the, the medical tests and stuff. So I missed the week of practice with the national team, and it was almost at the end of the, the training camp. So I didn't know if they were going to take me to Rio or, mm -hmm. or not just because I, I signed with the, uh, the NBA with Oklahoma. So when I came back and I realized uh, it was between me and, and Sunny Materio, the guy from Valencia, mm -hmm. and, and at the end they told me, like, we're finally going to get you. I was kind of, like, nervous because <laughs> it was, like, Olympic Games, like, the yeah. biggest event of, of, of the sports. The world, yeah. Well, yeah. But also, like, I was, I was so happy because I was going to, as you said, like, I was going to be able to live something that not a lot of people can, can live. Mm -hmm. uh, so after that, and, and obviously after winning the, the bronze medal, like, uh, it was a really nice experience. We get to meet, like, other sportsmen from, like, Rafa Nadal or mm -hmm. uh, Michael Phelps was over there, Usain Bolt, and you could see all these people, like, eating at, in the same place, like, yeah. in the table next to you and, like, acting like regular people, no? So Super casual, like big, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, like, a big time. So <laughs> it was a really good experience, man. I would like to repeat it this, this summer in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. My, well, I best best of luck to you guys in Tokyo. I talk to talk to Chacho all the time Thank about you. that, and he's uh, <laughs> he's he's excited, um, you know, excited yeah. about you know the opportunity to play um, in Tokyo. Now I want to go back to the beginning, you know, when you were younger, um, you know, what were your, you know, who were who were some of your early influences in basketball, and you know, when did you kind of fall in love with the game and know that you wanted to be a professional basketball player? Well, I started playing basketball when I was three, uh, no, actually four years old. Uh, because obviously my father, play, my father played here mm -hmm. in, in the Spanish league for five years in second division. Uh, so he's, he's always been in my family. <laughs> Since I was a kid, I was always yeah. shooting the ball. So <laughs> kind of grew up. That's why, uh, that's why you then... shoot so well now, man. You, you wanted to shoot <laughs> yeah, maybe. a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, after like uh, 16 years uh, that I was playing in, in the school, in my hometown in Mallorca, uh, Saragossa and Mala came and talked to well talked to my parents or my agent and said that they wanted to see me in like a short training camp like three four days mm -hmm. so that was the moment I was, I was I mean I was freaking out because I never left Mallorca and now going there and showing my skills to people that I didn't know and like a professional club and stuff I, I was impacted so it was a hard decision but I finally made through it, and and from that moment, I thought not that I was gonna be like a professional in the mm -hmm. in like like first level, but I had the chance, you know, the the opportunity to to show up in some kind of better level than I was, and try to to reach the goal that that or the dream that that I was having as a kid, you know, that play basketball in, in like now in Barcelona, Madrid, whoever team or mm -hmm. Euroleague. And obviously after then the, the NBA. So uh, if I had to say, we after the first year in, in Malaga, that, that was the moment that I something in my head clicked 
and 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 say like I could be like a professional and and having a long career in, in well whatever city it was. I have a question that I ask everybody, um, a lot of guys that played in the NBA and guys that played um, in EuroLeague. Which debut were you most nervous nervous about? Your senior team debut with Barcelona or your first game with Oklahoma City in the NBA? I would say NBA. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because NBA is like, the. I mean, when you're like a kid, you also, I mean, you watch games from Barcelona or from Madrid or from yeah. those teams, uh, but you play video games with NBA players and you're always looking highlights of NBA players. So it's kind of like a dream, you know, like you never think about playing in the NBA. Uh, you you can dream also about playing in, the, in Barcelona, but it's mm -hmm. not like what you think when you're a kid, you know, mm -hmm. you, you want the best for you. So, so yeah, when I made it, obviously when I signed the contract and everything, uh, I couldn't believe it, but, but then the first game, all the fans, uh, at home, or I think it was, no, I can't remember if it was at home or, or away, but whatever, like seeing all the fans, me dressed as, as a Thunder player next to Russell Westbrook and mm -hmm. playing against whatever, Steve Curry, LeBron James. And all those guys, I was like, what, what am I doing here? You know? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, after you go to the court, you show up and then the nerves go away. So <laughs> did you did yeah, you have really like a, a fan moment? Like, you know, I, like I talked to some guys and they're like the moment I, I guarded Kobe Bryant or for me, like when <laughs> Jessica played uh, San Antonio and Tim Duncan walked <laughs> on the floor. Like it was like, wow, like that's Tim Duncan. Like, did you have a did you yeah. have a moment or like? when somebody or a certain person walked in the game and you had to like kind of catch yourself, like, like, oh man, like I have to guard this guy. Like, I can't be a fan. <laughs> I had a lot of these moments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember when we played LeBron, uh, I don't even think it was the first year. I think it was the second year. Mm -hmm. And I was going to the bench because uh, Calderon was there. So mm -hmm. I was going to say hi, uh, bye to them after the game. And then mm -hmm. LeBron was coming in my direction. And we shake hands. Yeah. He wanted to shake hands. And he said, like, good job, Abrinas. And that moment, I thought, like, LeBron James knows who I am. <laughs> and I was, like, impact. Like, I didn't know what to say. So that was, like, a big moment. Like, that, that was the moment that uh, I put LeBron over Michael Jordan. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he knows you now. <laughs> Just because he knows me. <laughs> that makes, it, that makes yeah. total sense. Now, yeah, how... Also, Go ahead. I also remember one time, like my, my biggest idol or one of my biggest idols when I was a kid that was T Mac, uh, yeah. Grady. Yeah. And he was in one of the games, uh, I think it was on the sidelines, probably with SPN or, or I don't know, some TV. And uh, I mean, I didn't have the boss to go there and say, like, hi, you know? So I was just staring at him and I was like, man, it's, it's T Mac over there. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the only thing I couldn't say hello and and then I we started playing the game obviously and, and after the game I didn't see him but but yeah I would say those were the, the two biggest moments in the NBA for me yeah like I I remember like when I was like coming out of like college and I seen Dwight Howard for the first time and it was like mm -hmm. almost like you see like I seen the pictures, I seen like the commercials and stuff like that. And you're like, it, yeah, it, it doesn't seem real. Like, you know, this person yeah. walking by, you're just like, <laughs> so I can, I can only imagine for you to like to have to compete against these guys, you know, every single night, like, you know, guys that you, you know, looked up to or, you know, had posters yeah. on your wall or you play video games mm -hmm. with, you know, so I sure that was an amazing experience. He was, he was. <laughs> Now, how, how did you enjoy, I've been to Oklahoma City. Um, I was there for, you know, summer summer league and a, a couple of summer camps and stuff like that. But how did you enjoy, um, you know, living in OKC? Um, you know, you said you're coming from Mallorca, you know, then going to Malaga and then going to Barcelona. And mm -hmm. for those who don't know, Oklahoma City, it's a beautiful city. I mean, they have great fans, but it's not Mallorca by far. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, not even so close. yeah, not even close. <laughs> it's a very, very small, uh, rural town, I guess you would say. Yeah. Um, so how was the adjustment, you know, for you? I think the, the quite reason why I asked this a lot of times, um, you know, especially being overseas, people always talk about Americans or, you know, making the adjustment 
you know, to, you know, being in a foreign land, but they never really talk about, it gets talked about very rarely, you know, Europeans yeah, making the right. adjustment, you know, to life in America. So, you know, what was that adjustment like for you? And, you know, did you have like any, like an initial, you know, culture shock, you know, you know, when you first went over? Well, obviously that, especially at the beginning was, it was kind of hard because obviously the culture, the language, food, everything that changes. Mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't take me time, maybe because Oklahoma City is not like a huge city. Mm -hmm. So everything was kind of easy, you know, there were like three, four spots that you need to know. Uh, and then a couple of restaurants and that's pretty much it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so the city is pretty calm. Me and my wife went there and, and it was really easy. We, the, the hard part I would say was just being alone. Yeah. Not, not for me, because obviously I was practicing every day or traveling, but my wife, especially the first months that she didn't know, like other wives, uh, it was hard for her, but but once to, you get used to, I mean, it was kind of easy life, like just practice in the morning, then just go lunch. As I said, like we had like a couple restaurants that were our favorites and and then a couple spots to to go. As you said, you should be there. Like there's like a river walk and one day from Busters. Uh, one, but the <laughs> minor theater, league baseball, the minor league say. baseball team. <laughs> that's true, the minor league. And that's pretty much it. Like you had the two, two universities, but they were a little bit far from, from the Oklahoma City. And yeah, that's it. I mean, luckily we, you have Dallas. It's like a two hour and a half drive. So mm -hmm. we went there a couple of times, but... But yeah, as I said, like it's a small town. Uh, it was nice though, as you said, like the fans were crazy and, yeah. and cheering for us. Like you could walk on the streets and they were not bothering you, just saying like hi or or nothing. They were not asking for pictures, like like here in Barcelona or <laughs> in Spain. Uh, so they were uh, really res respectful, you know. So mm -hmm. it was kind of easy transition. Was there uh was there something about like American culture that like surprised you or is like a, a restaurant or like a fast food spot or something like you like <laughs> like you became in love with like Krispy Kreme or I don't know if there's something like that like you <laughs> went there and you were like wow like this is this is amazing or something like that. I would say the only food that I miss right now it's Wingstop. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we used to get every every time that we uh, get on the road. Uh -huh. uh, the first plane from Oklahoma, like the first year I, I had to go there and buy for the team. Yeah. Most of the times. But after that, like lemon peppers, like. <laughs> oh, you're, in, so you're, you're, a lemon, you're a lemon pepper guy? <laughs> yeah, lemon pepper. And my wife too. So yeah. we were ordering that like once a week at least. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. Do you man. think like there's, I mean, it's not like a culture of like food like yeah. you have here in Spain or in Italy. But you, you always think about fast food or things with a lot of sugar, mm -hmm. but it's actually really good. Yeah. Maybe it's not healthy. No, but it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and it's a problem. Yeah, that, that's that's the problem. I always say like it's it's not so much the, I wouldn't say so much the food. I feel like it's the choices. Like you have so many mm -hmm. choices there. So it's like yeah. okay, you can go like here, like in Europe, it's like okay, you can go to McDonald's and maybe they have a Burger King. But in the states, mm -hmm. they have a Burger King, they have a McDonald's, they have another uh, another burger place, they have you know Pizza Hut, this yeah. that, and the other. So like by the time you drive like down the street, there's like 15 different restaurants you pass, yeah. and it's like difficult. <laughs> or even if you go to the grocery store, there's like 25 yeah, different cookies and ice cream so you're just like yo i gotta yeah. <laughs> i gotta try it all <laughs> yeah that was a big problem <laughs> yeah man i yeah uh, i i almost uh i go home sometimes and i go to like the walmart and i'm almost like yo why do we have so much stuff here <laughs> but i mean it's part of our culture i guess you could say <laughs> yeah I mean, hopefully somebody from Wingstop uh, is watching this and we got to get you, get you some yeah. lemon pepper, so lemon open, pepper wing. Some, some yeah. stores here, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I, I try to make them here in, in at home and there's no way I can make not the, the same. same. No, not the same. They're not crispy or the flavor is not the same or so. I, I don't know the, the recipe. For, for yeah, that man, we got it. Barca's got to get a, a Wingstop uh, sponsorship, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> now, the people, you know, on people, I guess you could say the fans, they, on the surface level, they see the the contracts, they see the NBA lights, but they don't really see the life behind the scenes. 
Um, mm-hmm. So can you talk about that? You spoke about it a little bit about, you know, it's just like, you know, you go to practice and stuff like that. Is there something about the NBA life or lifestyle that surprised you? Because it's a lot different than Europe. Europe, everything is more, to me, it's more team oriented. You know, you go yeah. to team dinners, you go to team lunch, you know, up until maybe this year, or even last year, majority of teams had roommates. Um, you know, in the NBA, it seemed like there's a lot more isolation, you know, there's a lot more alone time. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, talk about that, you know, the, the, the NBA lifestyle and how that can have, you know, an impact on you, especially like you said, somebody coming, mm-hmm. coming from Europe. I mean, at the beginning it was, it was hard, especially on the, on the road trips because I didn't have any like big friends. I just mm-hmm. had teammates. Mm-hmm. So on the road, like, uh, I was just ordering room service, uh, for dinner or lunch or whatever. Uh, after that, like, uh, and thanks to Sabonis, uh, Stephen Adams, and mm-hmm. we had Ennis Counter. We got a lot of uh, players from from not well from Europe, but also from from outside the United States. So that helped me a lot, and we made uh, a small group, and and that helped me a lot. Also in Oklahoma, because mm-hmm. like we get to know each other and just go to, to this house and, and have a big dinner or or go to a restaurant with with uh, another player uh but yeah like first months were hard like as you say like isolated i had my computer i was playing video games in the hotel uh and after that yeah i mean especially when you go into miami or new york or like yeah. big cities uh, you get to know the, the cities and and, and just uh, going to a restaurant or whatever you just getting out of the hotel you know mm-hmm. and i also really like that one that that part because uh i remember we were getting to the hotel like around 5 p.m and they were saying okay let's, the bus leaves tomorrow at 10 and that that was the only rule <laughs> so after five you could do anything you wanted like you could go and visit the city you go outside oh. from dinner you can go a party if you want like so and that, that thing that's what i missed a little bit from from the the nba because mm-hmm. here as you said like there's also like it's like a schedule you get you get uh, to the hotel you you go to your room now you had your own room but before uh, it wasn't like that so then you have a team dinner and it's all in the hotel like you, yeah. you can maybe get out of the hotel but but the culture and the coaches are are not going to see it uh, like in the nba you know uh, so i think this needs to change. Yeah, I agree. we need to talk. We need to I talk agree. to somebody yeah, <laughs> to, to not swear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. <laughs> nah, because for the players, it's, it's easy. I mean, we don't have the, these long trips like in the NBA, mm-hmm. like playing away seven games. But we we're starting to get a couple long weeks trips. that we played two, yeah, two games uh, away, and especially in those moments, that's when you need to. Oh, wow to give a little to the players because being like four or five days uh, outside from, from your house, it's, it's tough. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree. Like the, one of the things like, like my family and my friends always ask me is like, you know, you go to Barca, you go to Madrid, you go to, you know, Istanbul and all these cities and you're like, well, how are the cities? And I'm like, honestly, we really don't get a chance to really experience it. Like we see the airport, the bus, the hotel, the arena, and then if you fly private, you're usually back home within the next day. So yeah. like, I agree with you. I mean, I think that's one of the most fascinating parts about, you know, playing for me as a foreigner playing overseas basketball is the opportunity to, you know, experience these cultures and experience these things. So uh, I agree with you 100 percent, man. I think that that's that has to be something that, um, you know, has to change and hopefully eventually will change, you know, in the future. Mm-hmm. Yes, it pisses me off. Like you visit maybe what, 30 cities over Europe? Yeah. And what you know about these cities? Absolutely really nothing. Nothing. Like, <laughs> nothing. So. nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully one day it'll hopefully it'll change, change before yeah. before I uh, before I get too old and retire. <laughs> 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 I, I, I want to ask you about uh, Russell Westbrook. Um, he just recently, um, you know, passed uh, Oscar Robinson's triple double record, um, and you were teammates with him. So, you know, let's talk about you know what type of person he is, and you know, where do you think he'll? Because right now the debate is, you know, is he, you know, where is he at as far as the historical, you know, as far as players, um, you know, where do you think he, you know, kind of lies in the history of players, and you know, how what type of teammate and what type of person was he, um, you know, during your time with him. Well, as a person, he's he's a ten. Uh, uh, he helped me a lot, especially in my first year because I was the rookie. So 
you see, he showed me the, the way to, to play in the NBA because it was different to Europe. He helped me on the road trips, especially the beginning, like he was taking me and Domas uh, to the movie theaters or to mm-hmm. restaurants. Or, uh, and as a player, as you said, like, I think right now, if you don't win championships, mm-hmm. they, you're kind of in another level, you know, yeah. the, they give a lot of importance to, to, the, to winning the ring of the NBA. And you can see like players like John Stockton, like mm-hmm. he's one of the best players ever and he didn't win a championship. Russ, he might get one, I don't know, in Washington, mm-hmm. but but he's doing historical things that mm-hmm. no one ever see that. Like, yeah, and I putting agree. numbers like 20, 18, 18. Yeah. Like you've never seen that. Video, video game numbers. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> So as a player, I understand like the people that think about like this, but but I was there and and just watching him as a basketball player, like he's unbelievable. Like his body was born to to do to be something else, you know. Because he was obviously I didn't see him working out in in summer, but during the season, because he was playing like forty minutes a game, he wasn't practice that much. He he wasn't on a gym a lot. Like I was going more to the gym than him, I would mm-hmm. say, but he was putting that crazy numbers mm-hmm. every night. So you could see like some people is they're born to do that, and and I mean he's for me he's he's one of the best players, not ever obviously, but but right now he's one of the best players in the NBA. Yeah, I agree. Like top ten. Yeah, I agree. I think he's gonna. I think he'll. I think he'll be more appreciated as, um, you know, as the years go by. I think it'd be yeah. one of those players that people will look back on and be like, like, you know, the fact that he plays so hard, the fact that he competed in the numbers mm-hmm. that he puts up, I think more people will appreciate, you know, what he was, um, you know, probably, probably further after his career was over. Yeah. I hope so. He deserves it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Now I want to shift, shift gears a little bit and kind of talk usually with this podcast, we talk, uh, you know, about basketball, but we also talk about some important topics. Um, in May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is that, you know, you were one of the first, um, you know, European or EuroLeague guys to speak out um, about the importance of mental health. Um, so first of all, um, you know, what, why, why did you decide to, to speak out? Um, and, you know, especially in Europe, um, now, I guess you could say in the States and I guess you're saying in Europe a little bit now, it's becoming a little more accepted to talk about these mm-hmm. things. But during the time when you kind of spoke out, you were, you know, among you, Kevin Love and a couple other guys and we were one of the first. And especially in Europe, it's almost, I guess you could say, looked at as weakness, I guess you can say, uh, you yeah. know, so, you know, so. First of all, I commend you. I never told you this in person, but I commend you for for speaking out. I mean, I think it was very brave of you to you know you. to to acknowledge and and to talk about this problem. But talk about that. You know, what made you want to speak out and want you you know make your story you know public? Mm-hmm. Well, especially two things. Uh, obviously, after I left Oklahoma and we broke contracts, like nobody knew what was happening. Mm-hmm. So being like a like a, an NBA player. Uh, Everybody was talking, you know. Yeah. And I, I read so many crazy stuff. Like, yeah. Uh, like I had a, like a cancer or like a big disease. Like my father was dying or like crazy stuff. And I realized that was like reading that over the days and in the months, that was hurting me more. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't get away. Like I, in one moment, I said, "Stop!" Like I need to tell this because, because of me, because I was getting mad or or sad because I was seeing some, some things on, on the, especially on the social media. And then also I wanted to talk it out because as you said, like, it was like a taboo, like, like nobody was speaking by that time about this, uh, mental health. And I knew like everybody at some point of his life is passing through some kind of problems, Definitely. Uh, especially like maybe you, maybe like me, maybe less, maybe even more. Mm-hmm. So by telling that, uh, what I wanted to say is like, like it doesn't matter who you are yeah. and which position you are, how much money you make. Like you, this is completely normal to have these problems and you have to speak out, uh, obviously first with wife, family, friends, mm-hmm. and then just 
trying to find like some professionals that can help you because as i said like this is like a sprained ankle or an acl torn like wherever something is physical but the brain is a muscle and when it gets sick you gotta treat it so uh, by sharing that video that i shared i just wanted to say to the people that they're not alone yeah that it's completely normal to to have this these mental problems and with help you can just get away with it and, and heal them mm. uh, as i said after that everything went okay i could get back to to playing basketball the thing that i loved and then hate and i couldn't mm -hmm. touch a basketball and just because sharing and, and trying to find the, the the people that helped me i could i was able to 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 do the thing that i loved for from three years old or four years old mm -hmm. you know? were you were you surprised about the the reaction or were you nervous about the reaction you know from the video um, were you nervous about, you know, the way the teammates or coaches or, um, you know, fans or your peers will, will respond? By that time, I was so focused on what the people was talking before the video mm -hmm. that I didn't think about what was, what was going to happen. You know, obviously it went viral more than I thought, mm -hmm. because I think it has like 1.2 million views on, yeah. on Twitter. So that's a lot. I didn't expect that, obviously. Uh but I, was, I also was really happy because that meant, and, and reading all the comments, they were like 99.9 .9 positive. Yeah. That they were with me, helping me, and thanks for sharing that. And and that also helped me uh, seeing all the, the, the caring for the, from the people that I didn't know, but they mm -hmm. were there. It, it helped me also to, to, to get back to my life before that. Mm -hmm. Like playing basketball, being with my, my wife, just going outside my house to dinner or to whatever, to the movie theaters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's it's really important to to share. Uh, obviously, I know it's hard because I was a person that that did. I don't like to talk about my problems. Yeah. Even with my wife, I have problems sometimes. Uh, but after that happened, like I realized, like. You, you talk, maybe you're mad one day or you, something happens, you talk it out and then the next day you feel better because you talk it out and you find this, the solution and, and you're working to get better and whatever aspect, you know? So that's where I learned, like mm -hmm. just talk it out to, to whoever it is, maybe your best friend, your girlfriend, your mom, your dad, whoever, your brother. And it's gonna help you. Like it's not gonna, ha nothing is gonna happen if you talk to, to somebody of your confidence like the yeah. small circle you have, uh, they're not going to hate you. They're not going to say like you're stupid or, or whatever. So you, you need to just open yourself and, and try to, to find a solution for, for your problem. Now, when you, and you don't have to get really into detail, but when you were going through this, this, this mental health, um, you know, problems mm -hmm. um, in OKC, um, what were some of the things that you were feeling? And then when did you first, I guess, understand that, you know, that, cause I think, I think for a lot of us that deal with mental health problems or deal with this, I think the first thing is kind of denial. Like you don't think mm -hmm. like, you know, you're going through it. Like, you know, you're just like, ah, I'm going to get out of it. But when did you first understand that? Like this was, you know, a, a true, I guess you would say a uh, problem and that was really affecting you. So I stopped playing uh on the 25th on christmas day in houston mm -hmm. uh, that was the day that i blocked and i, and I couldn't play mm -hmm. so i would say like a month before so i got sick or one or two months uh and i was throwing up on i think it was in phoenix and a couple other cities so we thought it was a virus mm -hmm. uh then you know uh something has happened uh it was happening like physically me like i was mm -hmm. getting sick my headache or, or whatever so after a couple of times getting this and I didn't have fever, but, but I was having something and I didn't have the, the passion that I had before to go into the practices or to the games. Like I didn't want to get out of my bed or yeah. whatever. I started realizing maybe something has happened to me. So mm -hmm. I started talking to, to a professional here in Spain he was helping me a lot, but, but it was enough. Uh, it wasn't enough because I was also in the routine at the same time of mm -hmm. playing and practicing and it was getting worse and worse every day. 
So as I said earlier, like on the 25th, uh, I shocked. Uh, I had to talk to, to one of the assistant coaches that he was practicing with me and he speaks Spanish. So I tell him all the story, talk to Sam Presti, who was the GM. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, well, they helped, they helped me a lot. They said, okay, no problem. You stay in the locker room, calm yourself and, and we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. So from that moment on, I start uh, talking to the, the psychologist of the team mm -hmm. and I was not practicing with the team at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just going there when nobody was there, mm -hmm. uh, just talking to the, to that girl and I was getting better. Uh, I was almost like, say like three weeks just by myself. I remember then going when, when Andrew Robertson that he was injured, he was practicing. I was going there when he was there, you know, kind of like start interacting with some of the players and it was going good till I played two or three games in February, early February. And then I shocked again. And after that time, I knew I couldn't get better if I was thinking like, okay, I'm going to get away from the team, work on the mental health. And then at some point I have to come back to this situation. Yeah. So that was the moment I talked to, to the GM, to my Asian coaches, obviously. And then I said, like, look, this has happened to me. I don't think I can get away. So I was able to, to be in that position that stopped working mm -hmm. and just get well. Uh, I know some of the people that are passing through this, they cannot stop working because they yeah. need that money. Uh, but I was I was a lucky man uh, and, and I could get, well, stop the, the basketball thing and, mm -hmm. and I, I remember the first or the second day I, I signed the papers. Uh, I also I, I felt better really? just by signing them and said like, okay, there's no more pressure to come back. Yeah. Now I have my time to to get well, to work on the, my mental health, and work on and yourself. Try to get better. But you know, yeah. basketball was not like a thing just going through my mind that, that I had to play again one game. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that, that was pretty much it. How do you, you know, how do you feel um, as far as like in European basketball standards, how do you think we've removed the stigma of being mental health looked upon as a weakness? We're on the way. Mm -hmm. I think I still can see it, uh, but much less, obviously. Um, I don't know if I was the first one. I was one of the first, as you said, but but you could see, like, especially like some sportsmen from from I don't know tennis, soccer, wherever sport, or famous people, actors, starting to to speaking out of of uh, about mental health. Mm -hmm. So now it's kind of getting to the society. There's still people that they don't understand because they never had this issue, so they don't believe it could happen to them. But but I think we're changing that. Uh, that way that the people were looking at uh, the at these mental problems mm -hmm. now with with social media with fans with family with the pressure that you even put on yourself um i think it's a time period right now where the athletes are dealing with amongst you know a, a mm -hmm. huge amount of pressure um so as somebody that has gone through it um, what advice would you give to athletes especially younger athletes that are kind of coming up in this um, how to find an outlet, um, you know, to kind of deal with this pressure of being, you know, a, a sports, you know, a sportsman or, you know, an athlete. I mean, it's hard. It depends on the, the, the person, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, now it's even harder because, as you said, like there's a lot of social media going on and, and everything you do, uh, it's on the social media immediately, mm -hmm. you know. So what I did is, is just delete all the apps, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, not Facebook, not that much, but especially uh, uh, Twitter, because like people, they like to speak. Yeah. And, and <laughs> most of the times in a bad way. Yeah, yeah. So if you're not able to, to read that and, and say like, okay, <laughs> I don't care, then you have a problem. Yeah. So you need to learn that you're in a tough position because you're famous and there's people that they're not famous and they're mm -hmm. going to try you 
to, to say bad things to you just because sometimes it's just because they want to, they, they don't have the life you, you have, yeah. the, the facilities you have, the money, the, the, the life. So they're mad at you just because of that, not yeah. because you're a bad person or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I have some cases that people were talking about me on Twitter and I reply them. And then the next question, the next, the next tweet was, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I deleted the, the tweet. Uh, I'm sorry. Thanks for answering me. You know, like yeah. fucking up, and you said like, "What well, you said that in the first?" <laughs> What's the purpose you know? of the? Yeah, was like, the purpose of the, yeah. the the whole conversation? And that happens a lot, especially in Twitter. So yeah, yeah it's kind of right now. It's a tough time to <laughs> to be in those uh, social media because you're so exposed. Uh, that I know, like I don't know what advice can I tell you because you're always going to hear something about uh, people talking about you if you did something good, if you had a bad game or, or whatever. So you just got to take care of your business. And, and I mean, as I said, you got your small circle, your teammates, and just talk to them. And and whatever people say on, on the streets, you don't care. You don't have to care because they don't know what's going on in your life or in the Absolutely locker or, or in the games. Absolutely true. How can how can your league teams? Because um, you spoke about OKC, them having you know a team psychiatrist or a lot of teams in the NBA having you know a mental health coach or or somebody like that. How can teams in the Euro League help players deal with mental health or or help them um, you know with these issues that you know um, that they face on a day to day basis? Well, I don't know about most of the teams in Europe uh, here, we have a couple, mm -hmm. but I think they're for, for the whole FC Barcelona. I yeah. don't know if soccer, but, mm -hmm. but like hockey or, uh, or handball, uh, we had a couple of, a uh, couple of girls. They work for us. If you need them, yeah. like they're not with us, but if you need at some point, go and talk to them, you, you can always go. So I think it's really important to, to at least have one just in case mm -hmm. i'm okay if you don't want to talk like every week or every two weeks because like i mean as i said like how right now i'm uh, i wouldn't go to the psychologist once a yeah. week or two yeah, yeah. or once every two weeks but i want to be sure that if something's going on i have a right person in the right spot that can help me out with with, with mental issues you know Right now, it's kind of hard, especially, I don't know, I mean, I think in Spain, in basketball in Spain, uh, the players look for that specialist outside the, the club, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, in Barcelona, it's getting better because we're getting, we're trying to get some people, but I think it needs to be more important, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, like you have like a physio or we have three physios and two doctors mm -hmm. and on the team, we don't have a psychologist why so i think the future is to, to have one it's like you have a doctor you have a psych uh, psychologist because it's, it's a muscle like mm -hmm. as i said before so yeah man. but i think it's, I, it's getting better yeah man, when I, people talking out they're they're, they're doing that uh, they're making that possible yeah so i mean I, talking out and it's out there so yeah i agree i think what and what, what elpa has done too is by you know doing a, a mental health advisory board that you know allows you know players to you know eat outlet as well um but i agree too i think it's 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 not where it should be at um but yeah. i think it, we are definitely light years ahead of where we were i guess you could say even you know three four mm -hmm. five years ago um yeah. so but and i think a lot of that a lot of that has to do with you too like i said i mean i i i, I I think by you speaking out um, and by you, you know, having the success that you have had in your career, mm -hmm. um, I think people have realized that this is an important issue. Um, and, you know, I think that if you know, if, if somebody of yourself or like somebody like, you know, high level athletes can deal with this, imagine what, you know, normal person or other people um, yeah. that maybe non athletes are dealing with this as well. Yeah, sure. So the, the last I have a couple couple last questions for you. Um, the last question I, I say is, uh, how important is mental health? Um, you know, just, just kind of a general, you know, your general feelings about it, you know, how important is it, um, you know, in, in life, not just in sport, I would say, but just in life in general. I mean, it's, it's really important. As I said, uh, I have problems and, and away from basketball, I couldn't get out of my bed. 
mm-hmm. at the worst. So it's a big issue. Uh, I don't know how to explain the situation that I was, uh, but I mean, maybe for at least a couple of weeks, I, I didn't get out of house on my house. So that's a lot of time uh, for like, especially me that I was a, a basketball, professional basketball player. Like yeah. I was not doing exercises. I was just watching the TV with my phone or playing video games or and, and eating. <laughs> that was the only thing I was doing. So, so that can bring you like really big issues also uh, in, in your health. Like you're not eating well, you're not doing exercise at the end of all it's all connected you know so i would say 50 50 you know the the mental health is like 50 percent, and the physical health uh, it's another 50 but they're connected uh if you hurt you get injured and you're away because you turn your acl you're going to be your mental health is going to be really really bad but if your mental health is really bad it's also going to cause problems in your, in your physical as I was throwing up or I had headache or you're getting fat and then you have having diabetes or some other bigger problems, you know? So I think it's everything connected. Mm-hmm. So there's no one with the other. I agree, man. Well, uh, last question and I'm gonna let you get out of here. I know it's a, it's a late night. Yeah, don't worry. Um, <laughs> the question I always ask, um, you know, in this pod is your, who is your favorite past and present EuroLeague player? Past and present. Okay, yeah. past, I got to say, uh, Navarro. Oh, okay. <laughs> of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, but he, he was the guy I was looking at uh, when uh-huh. I was a kid. So, yeah. because I was a Barca fan. So, so yeah, I was always looking at Navarro. Um, and then from now, it's a tough one, man. You should tell me before. <laughs> that's the whole, that's the, so that's the whole part, man. It's the whole part. I got to spring it on you. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you one thing. Uh, the players that ask you this question, they yeah. say players from their former team or not? Uh, it's been a mix. Honestly, it's been a, a mix. mix. Yeah, okay. it's been a mix of like players. Like some some guys say players that are on their current team, but then they also say like former teammates that are playing elsewhere. So it's kind of been a kind of been a mix. I mean, I will say power right now, but mm-hmm. uh, I mean, that's a good answer. Besides power, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's no best option, I think, yeah. <laughs> right now. Yeah, you can't go wrong with power. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go with power. <laughs> All right, I mean, I, hey man, that's a good answer, man. But uh, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, you know, talking about this important topic, man. I appreciate you know, uh, you know, you. Um, good luck, um, you know, in all your Thank upcoming you. games, except for the, the semifinal or the final four. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you already other, have a couple, man. <laughs> other, hey, man, you know, I'm stingy, man. I'm greedy. <laughs> uh, but nah, but just joking around, man. I, I definitely wish you best yeah. of luck, man. You, you've always been one of my, you, um, you know, favorite players to play against. You know, I, I love to see when you're playing well, you know, always smiling on your face, always laughing, man. So mm-hmm. um, always wishing you. you the best, man. And I thank you. Thank you for uh, taking the time. Thank you.